Familiarity breeds complacency. Familiarity breeds complacency. I was riding down the road the other day with my two kids. My boy's nine. That boy's getting smart. He's almost as smarter than me. Like, like that show, Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? I don't think I'm about to where I'm smarter than a third grader. <laughs> God, that boy's sharp. All right, well, and uh, I was like, hey, Noah, remember when you used to go to daycare right over here? It was some St. Anne's daycare right up there across from the Shell Station on Renola. Uh, and it was very convenient to my work. And uh, he said, yeah. And I said, you remember that, that woman's name that was your first teacher? And her name was, uh, and I probably can't remember it now, but I remembered it in that moment. Well, y'all don't know his name. Her name was Miss Harriet. And I was like, you remember Miss Harriet? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, you remember that other name, that other lady like Miss Lisa? He's like, yep. Okay. And in that moment, I happened to dawn on me that I kind of don't even know my other daughter's, my second daughter's name of her teacher now, much less her first one. Because here's what happens, and this is what happens to all of us, because familiarity breeds complacency. When it was my first child, I walked in there and I had a radar on. First of all, it was this Episcopalian church. A what? I didn't grow up in the church. I want to make sure they wasn't going to be teaching my kid anything there. All right, and I'm looking around and studying the room. They have sinners. Everything's in the center. I'm studying every center to make sure there's everything's in there that I approve of. Okay, I'm meeting and talking to the teachers and getting to know them because it was all unfamiliar to me, okay? But now when my second child came along, I kind of had, I was versed at it, so to speak, okay? So I became complacent with all that stuff. I made the base assumption that nothing was going to go wrong. Everything was going to be okay, so I just stopped doing that. I had become complacent, and that was an opportunity for the evil one to come into my life, to come into my family, okay? So that's just a, an opening point I want to make. It's not really what I'm preaching on, uh, but familiarity breeds complacency. And tonight, I basically have two points. I want to remind you that you're in a battle, okay? Your flesh man and your spirit man are at odds with one another. Galatians chapter 5 says that the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another so that you cannot do the things that you would. Now, we're going to get into this a little bit deeper in a minute because I'm going to be in the book of Romans tonight. And if you've been coming to Logos Bible class at 9 a.m. before church, you're going to have a deeper understanding of the book of Romans. And I've told you before, and I'll tell you again, if you understand the doctrine in the book of Romans, you got a good foothold on the entire New Testament. If you got a foothold on the New Testament, you got a foothold on this whole thing called Christianity. Praise God. So in the book of Romans, in around chapter 8, Paul reminds us that we're heirs of God. Do you know what an heir is? I know you've heard that before. We're heirs to the kingdom. Jesus paid the way, he defeated it, and he gave us the kingdom, and he allows us to be heirs. Well, the word heir is a person legally entitled to the property or rank of another person on that person's death. That's what the world definition of that is, and it is applicable here. Well, guess what? Jesus has already died, and he's risen again, and he's given us the kingdom. We're rightful heirs that we can receive God's kingdom, okay? So now remember my points here. Familiarity breeds complacency, okay? You're in a battle. I came into the church in about 2010, got saved in 98, finagled around, floundered around, whatever, didn't have any word in me, and then God came and got a hold of me in 2010. I didn't grow up in the church. And he pretty quickly put a call to preach on me, which put me in a circle of elevated men, of God, men and women of God. Well, one of the observations that I've made since I've been in that 
as I've seen a many of them fall. Much less people in the congregation because you basically would make the assumption that the guy standing behind the pulpit ought to know a little bit better than the people sitting in the pews. So what I've seen is both. And so if I step back and I reflect upon that, the basic summary that I can come up with is because people are in battles and they don't even know it because they haven't stopped to think about it because the believer has become complacent. Christianity has become familiar to you and therefore you've put your guard down. When I go home tonight, I'm not going to go through every room of my house to see if there's an intruder because I'm familiar with it and you might say that I become complacent in that area. And there could very well be an enemy in my house, and I don't even know about it. Are you following me? So my sermon title is actually, You Are an Heir of God. Because I want this to be positive and uplifting, and not some kind of downer as we go into this new year. Praise God, did you have a good year, and you're ready for a great new one? Amen. Hallelujah, so am I, in the name of Jesus. All right, so let me give you just a little bit about the book of Romans. All right. Um, the book of Romans is a formal argument. Okay, I won't bore you with all the details, but it's called a scholastic diatribe. Paul was very educated. He was educated in classical Greek. A scholastic diatribe is actually a formal argument that you go on to 70, page 79 of a Greek uh, textbook on rhetoric and there would be a scholastic diatribe. It has nine specific components. Paul knew this. So when he set out the book of, to write the book of Romans, actually he dictated it to his secretary, Tertius. Um, he used a scholastic diatribe, and he set out to check off the boxes. Okay, now why do you say that? Well, because if you understand this, and when I teach specifically on this, I use a Rubik's Cube. And I talk about the complexity, how the, the million, billion, trillion combinations there are. But you still got those guys and gals that can wiggle it and make it so in just a couple of seconds. That's because there's an underlying simple architecture to something that's very complicated on the surface. Okay? So if you understand this structure, no matter where you go in the book of Romans, if you understand the structure, you can birth a new and deeper understanding of it. Okay? So very quickly, I want to give you what that is, and then I want to go to a couple of places inside the book of Romans. But because you have a deeper understanding of the book of Romans, you will have a deeper understanding of the points that I'm trying to make. So if you've been in my Logos Bible class over the past couple of weeks, you would understand, for example, when Pastor, he did it today, said flip to Romans chapter 12. And I'm tempted to call on somebody. And immediately, I've been telling you, in your mind, you should go to, that's Paul saying, if that section in, that, in chapter 12 is, he, print, he, prevent, he puts forth his idea, he thoroughly goes through it, and then that's where, if you believe the thesis that he's stating, this is how you would apply it in your life. Okay. Let me just give it to you real quick, because it's pretty cool. So Paul gives an introduction in chapters 1, 1 through 15. And then he states his thesis. Now, Alan Medley, I'm going to call you out, brother. He always makes fun of me when I say the thesis and says I ought to do this and do the nerd sound when I say thesis. <laughs> But all he's doing is he's, a thesis is simply a presentation of an idea of an argument, okay? And then through this scholastic diatribe, it has specific components. So in um, chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, is the statement of the thesis, okay? So the book of Romans is what I'm telling you, is a complicated piece of, art, of, of literature, okay? But it all revolves around those two verses. So... If you want some memory verses, there's you a couple of good memory verses. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation 
to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein, for wherein? For in the gospel. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Yeah. Written where? Habakkuk 2.4, where it says the just shall live by his faith. Okay? So the entire book of Romans, you could say there's power in the gospel. And that we receive it by faith. And you ought to be seeing it walking out in my life. Amen. It reminds me in the book of James about you tell me about your faith, I'll tell you about my, you can see my faith through my works. Now, we're not saved by works, but if you have faith, your neighbor ought to be able to see it. And you ought to be able to see the power of it in your own life. And trust me, there's the power in walking in faith. States his thesis, and immediately part of this scholastic diatribe is what you would do is you would state the opposite of the thesis. Or, sorry, Alan, the antithesis, antithesis, the opposite of the thesis. So he does that. So you want to look at something and, and uh, what it looks like to walk with your back turned to God and you're not walking in the gospel, then you would go into and look at this uh, demonstration by antithesis in chapter 1, verses 18 through 320. And man, there's some mean stuff up in there. There's some people like when you see in the world and all this corruption, and uh, we're, we'll take a look at it, a little bit of it here in a second. And then lest you forgot what the thesis is, the next part is you restate the thesis. And he does that in chapter 3, verses 21 through 31. I'm telling you, when I found this and discovered this, this unlocked the book of Romans I'm trying to make this as much as entertaining as possible. A uh, uh, pastor calls it hucking and bucking. If you want to see me hucking buck, right, I'll huck and buck. But get this down because it'll open up the book of Romans. And if you understand the book of Romans, you understand a whole heck of a lot about the deeper theology behind Christianity. Christianity. And then he moves in after he's restated the thesis. He demonstrates it by example. And he uses Abraham in the deadness of Sarah's womb. And he received that by faith. What God told him is that you're going to have a boy. And your seed is going to come through that of many nations. And he believed God. And what was it in Genesis? I don't know. Something, something. And God, what? Imputed to him as righteousness. Abraham believed God imputed to him as righteousness. Imputed as simply means put it into his bank account, applied it to him. And then he goes through a large section in chapter 6 all the way through a, a chapter 11 where he anticipates um, because we couldn't have a two-way conversation. He's sending out a letter. He anticipates your objection on the other side of the argument and he handles that. So right there in, in, in chapter 6, you can see that in question for him. Where it says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin such that grace may abound? Because in chapter 5, before that, and I think I skipped over it, he does the exposition of his thesis where he shines a light on it. In the beginning of that one, you can see, well, if I believe this, and this, there ought to be something that comes with it. And what's the first part of, of Romans chapter 5? It says, well, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ and his shed blood. I've never had my Bible flip closed on me before. They don't have timeouts. Now it's opening my email. All right, praise God. Let me just, you know, that what I just talked, let me give you a real quick testimony about um, um, well, let me back up before that. And uh, I mean, I don't even have to get done with this message. You guys have already heard between Gary and this enough word to get the whole world saved. All right. So l l l I'm just going to go until my cutoff point, and then I'm going to move into an opportunity for you guys to make some Holy Ghost New Year's resolutions. 
So you might want to be thinking about something that you got in your life that you want to get rid of and be coming up in here and getting rid of it. All right. Uh, where was I? So when I was praying about what to preach on, I heard fornication in my spirit several times. I'm like, I'm not preaching on fornication with all those kids in here. And by the way, don't worry about it if you're thinking like, oh, is he saying fornication? If your kid knows what fornication means, you need to be talking to him about it. Praise God. So remember what I was talking to you about in that first anti antithesis, what it's like to walk without God? Well, guess what? Well, you got a list in there of what it looks like. God will turn uh, what, what your life will look like. Let me find where it is real quick. And I apologize. I'm going to get more versed with this thing. Praise you, Father. Um, notice in, in Romans 1 and verse 28, it talks about God turning you over to a reprobate mind. Now, some of this stuff you're just going to have to dig in and read for yourself, but it's a pretty cool. Um, in in um, verse 29, there he begins to list these things. As you turn away from God and you say, um, I'm not going to go after that. This is what's going to happen. And then in verse 29, we say, being filled with all unrighteousness. And that first word, a lot of times when you see these lists of things, like in Galatians, you got a list in the flesh, and then you got a list in the spirit. Um, these sexual sins are listed first. Why? Well, because they're rampant. They were rampant in that church, and they are rampant in our world today. There's a lot of familiarity in there that could breed some complacency. And next thing you know, it's crept into your life. Life. Now, the only other thing I want to mention about this is if you look at that word in the Greek, and I always used to think when preachers say, when you look at that word in the Greek, like, how do they know that? I'm not educated in this stuff, right? Well, this E sword, you just click on it, and it's like got you right there in the Greek. That word fornication is a waste basket term. Anything that deviates from marriage between one man and one woman Anything that, anything that deviates from that in a sexual nature is called fornication. Just throw it into that waste basket, basket over there called fornication. Okay? Now there's that. If you look at that word in the Greek, you know what the Greek word for fornication is? Pornia. P-O-R-N-E-I-A. Need I say anything more? If you believe looking at a little porn here and there is not in the will of God. Praise God. All right, I'm moving on. I, I, I told him, Lord, praise God, you prick the spirits. I don't know what. Okay. All right, now something, remember I talked about in, 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 uh, in uh, Romans chapter 6, he said, should we sin that grace may abound? Because right before that, he's talking about the law and how much greater grace was, and it supersedes the law. And um, so wherever there was sin, grace did much more abound because the purpose of the law was not to, uh, uh, it, the, the purpose of the law was to make man aware that he's a sinner because you can't keep it, okay? It sets a benchmark, right? If I go out, nobody's ever sent me an award for keeping the speeding, right? If I go through this year and I haven't sped any, the DMV doesn't send me a letter and go, congratulations. It basically sets a baseline. The only time that you hear anything is when you transgress across it, okay? So when you think about God's law, it's, a similar, it's very similar to that. It makes you aware of what the limitations are, okay? So this, and um, I just want to give this little quick testimony too. So I had this friend in high school, and um, I mean, we'd run around, we were drinking. That's when I started drinking, it was in, a, in my high school, senior year in high school, and this guy was included in that. And we ran around, and remember, I didn't grow up in the church. Y'all were a bunch of Bible-thumping, holy, rolling, wasting your life away, people. And uh, uh, he went off, he was a pretty sharp guy, he was in that ROTC thing, and then he was very good at it, and he went out and got him a scholarship to the Air Force Academy. And while he was in the week one at the Air Force Academy, the Lord spoke to him audibly and said, go home. 
And so he went and talked to the chaplain, thought he was going nuts, but whatever, he obeyed the voice and went home. Went to some church camp with one of his buddies that summer. Remember, we just graduated from high school. And he got uh, through a stick in the fire, or whatever they do in those things, and he got saved, okay? But he was kind of like me when I got saved in 1998. He was just, Ned didn't grow up in this stuff. He didn't have any word in you. And so he just kind of fell back into that, um, uh, the, the sower parable years is what I call them. I didn't have any word in me. So when that sun came out and started persecuting me, I withered up and died. Backed away from it. So he's sitting, here's another one. If your kids understand this, you need to be talking to them about it, okay? If they're old enough to understand and you're not talking about them, you need to. So him and his buddy were sitting smoking dope. I actually went to high school with this guy, too, because after he got saved, he's like, well, I got to get in school. So he ended up doing something like going to uh, um, Western Carolina or something. I'm just kidding, babe. Oh. <laughs> uh, and him and his buddy sitting there like this one day, and his buddy goes, hey, man, what's that? He's like, what are you talking about? He's like, that thing, that thing on your neck right there. I was like, it's a, it's a cross. He was like, well, why are you wearing it? Remember, this is after he heard the voice, came home and got saved, and now he's deciding to figure out what to do with his life. And right in that moment, he said that his testimony is that God convicted him to this verse. What shall we say then? Shall I continue to sin such that grace may abound? So one of the things that I've seen in the church is that I believe, my takeaway, is that there's Christians in this day and time who get hung up in what I, I know is the church term now is, and you guys probably understand it, is cheap grace. The reality is, if you have a pet sin, if you have a sin, if you have any kind of thing, that you think is hidden, or if it's got a cold to you, you need to get rid of it. Grace doesn't cover that stuff. Because you've heard tonight that it's not okay. So even if you did before, from this moment forward, you know better that it's not okay. As a matter of fact, you can get rid of it tonight. I don't care what it is, but you can come up here and give it to that cross. Praise God. So, all right, so... Um, Romans 7, 7 through 25 is a, a law was prevented, presented there. It's called the law of sin. Paul calls it the law of sin, okay? Because Paul was that, back this guy where they had all these laws, and that's what he knew. His world was kind of framed in around a law. Basically what he means is how and you and I would understand it is if I take this bottle of water and I hold it right here and I drop it, what's it going to do? It's going to go to the ground. Because everybody in here knows that it's governed by an underlying force or a law. That's what he means. That's what it means by the law of sin. So I just want to read a couple of these verses. And you, these, some of these are probably pretty familiar to you. Like it gets down in Romans 7. Read Romans 7. This is good stuff. In Romans 7 and 14, for when we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, means I'm a flesh, sold under sin. For that which I do, I do not. I, sorry. For that which I do, I allow not. For that which I would, that do I not, but what I hate, that I do. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then there is no more that I do it, but sin that dwells in me. Now remember, this is Paul writing this right now, and he wrote two-thirds in the New Testament. Saw God on the street, talked to him, had all of these revelations and dreams, and even he's like, I don't even know what happened this one day, but I was like, I would think I was in the third heaven. So this is a guy who had a pretty good, strong relationship with God, but yet here he is pinning and talking about, man, I do things that I don't want to do. My spirit man says, go here, and this stupid flesh man is saying and finding myself doing the very thing I don't want to do. Now, remember when I told you familiarity breeds complacency and you're in a battle. I see these Christians who are forgetting that they're in a battle and you're in a battle with some very powerful forces. When God called me to preach, for example, he took a lot of things from me. He took the filth out of my mouth, replaced it with the preach. He took drinking from me. Cigarettes... 
Some of you in here know my testimony there. He, that was a powerful one. He took it in an instant. Sent me a prophet because he knew I thought I'd be going crazy. Spoke to me that day, but he was cleaning me up because he knew everybody in here would be having their eyes on me. Nobody wants to get up here and listen to a preacher who drinks, smokes, and cusses and doesn't walk out this thing called holiness. And I wouldn't want to listen to him either. So I began to understand that, that God was cleaning me up for those reasons. But he took uh, alcohol from me. Do you know over the Christmas holidays, I had a wave of wanting to drink a beer? I haven't drank in seven years. But I had a wave of wanting to drink a beer. And then the next thing you know, the devil starts coming in like, man, you in your own house, just run down there and get you a beer. Ain't nobody going to know about it. Who's going to see you? You don't live in no King, North Carolina. You all the way over here in uh, Yakinville. Who's going to be up in there to see you buy a beer? I'm like, well, you better get out of here. I don't even want that junk. You know what? I've done coke once back in my day. And I, I tell you to tell this just how these voices are very powerful. And you best not try to go at it alone. You best get the Holy Ghost to help you break through on some of this stuff. Okay? I'm just telling you, I did dick coke one time, and the next time I saw that same dude at a party, and I'm bumping him like, dude, go get some more of that stuff. And in that moment, I bumped him, and I was about to do something. If he told me no again, I was about to get angry with this guy. And I mean, look at my body frame. I don't need to be getting angry with no dudes, right? I, but I don't care. That's the kind of stuff that does to you. I didn't care. I was about to annihilate this. It's like, you're going to do what I want you to do. But right in that moment, I knew that voice was not mine. That was the, I didn't even know about, I was, this, was, this was long before I knew God, who God's voice was. But I knew that voice, I had enough sense to know that, well, that voice was something that wasn't me. And it was evil, and I didn't want no part of it. Praise God. I'm telling you for this reason, y'all need to start. When you hear these voices, all, it's really simple. All you need to do is this. And go the other way. Pick up your Bible and read it. Do something. Tell it no. I didn't go get a beer, by the way. Praise God. All right. I need to, I need to speed up here. All right, so this law of sin, you guys understand that. Um, uh, so then over in Romans chapter 8, so we're still in the, he's handling the objections to his thesis in Romans 8, 1 through 8. Now you guys know that one. And man, these are some memory verses. You're struggling with a, a depression or not feeling good about something? You know, uh, you can put on your, what is it? Um, you can put on your garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness like we was talking about earlier. Or you can go and read Romans chapter 8 and realize who you are in Christ. And what comes along with that is some pretty powerful stuff. Let me just read a little bit of it to you. Lest you forgot and you have become complacent and you letting some of this junk creep into your life. There is no Romans 8 chapter 1. There is now therefore no condemnation in them that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Praise God. There's no condemnation in those who are Christ Jesus. If you wake up in the morning and you just feel uneasy, like there's some kind of condemnation on you, and you know Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior and your blood bought and know where you're headed, you don't need to get a hold of that stuff. You just need to realize who you are in Christ. Understand that you got the key keys to the kingdom and put it behind you. Resist, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Now listen, in Romans 8, 12, and 17, it gets even better. Let me remind you, 
in Romans 8 and 12, it says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you will die. It's not rocket science. Listen, if I had bumped that guy one more time and talked him into it, and I believe I could the way I felt, I wouldn't be standing here. You know why? Because I'd be dead by now. Because I have at the root of me an addictive personality, and I'd have taken it to the... The problem with sin is, is you got to do it more, and you got to do it more. So that little pet thing in your life could be a monster if you don't get rid of it. Get rid of it. And remind that the Lord spoke to me fornication. Maybe he was speaking to me. Praise God. All right. So in 814, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are sons of God. For you have not, now listen to this part, this is your reminder. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for that. Handing you the keys to the kingdom. All you got to do is walk it out by faith in verse 16. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that I and you are a child of God. If you don't have that bearing witness in your spirit today, I'm here to tell you by this word and by my own testimony, you can get it in this here and now. All you need to do, there's a little line up here. And back there is not having it, and up here is having it. And all you got to do is get your feet after it and come and get it. Because are you a whosoever? Yeah. Because the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. The Bible is so simple, a child could understand it. And it's so complicated and deep, a man of God, a woman of God can study it for a lifetime and just scratch the surface. Now it took a genius God to do that, did it not? Speaks to both an unbeliever and a believer at the same time. We got 10 minutes. All right. Well, I'm going to skip some stuff. How about that? Good. Remember, practical implications of the thesis. If you believe the thesis is true, power of God's salvation is in the gospel. The gospel, by the way, is not an idea. It's a man. It's a man who came and he walked this earth and he lived a sinless life and he went to the cross and he bore the sins of the world and he was dead, buried, rose again. You don't believe me? Go read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 1, and Paul says exactly that. Remember the gospel I preached to you? Well, here it is, and that's essentially exactly what he says. It's the man, Christ Jesus, and what he did for you and I. Now, listen, repentance. One, 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 one thing about repentance is getting a made-up mind and turning around and going the other direction. And God will meet you in that and give you the power to make it so. Be it your salvation, be it your healing, be it getting rid of this pet sin that you seem to got, and you're about to do a Holy Ghost New Year's resolution and get rid of it. This ain't something you have to struggle and battle with in this flesh and your spirit, and you can't win. You need to call upon the name of the Lord to get rid of it because you got to remember you got those keys in your pocket to the kingdom of God. And is he a rich man? He said, who? And the universe was. And he's given you a key to that power. Come next Wednesday, we're going to open up a teaching series on the Holy Ghost. And I got an awesome message for you. It's going to be really cool. If you're scared, intimidated by the Holy Ghost and his healing, and speaking in tongues and all this other stuff, come because I'm going to weave in some testimony and you're going to have to do it like they talk, talk about the Lord. He was, either, he was either a lunatic, he was either a liar, or he was the Lord. And I'm going to give you this, some similar testimony in this teaching out of this workbook. Dude, you're going to have to go, either go, he's either a lunatic, a liar, or he's a servant of the Lord. You're going to have to pick one of the three. Praise God, and he is Lord. 
All right, listen. We're going to have to get quick here. 2 Corinthians 10, 14 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, and pulling down the strongholds, casting down imagination and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obe obedience of Christ. Now, I don't have time to preach on that, but I just want to remind you of that. And the last thing I want to remind you of, uh, y'all come on up here and get ready to sing a song real quick. Every who can do it quickest. We only got a few minutes. Why don't these, why don't these two, James and uh, Sandy, why don't you guys just do a little background song and just sing holy, 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 holy over and over or something. It'll be fine. Now listen, I'm going to do an altar call real quick and we do not have time to tarry because people want to hug and kiss here at midnight, right? If this has been speaking to you, one of the great things about our God is when I get up here and this allows me to be bold is because I know I don't have to do anything. All I got to do is preach God's word and he pricks in people's spirit. If God's pricking your spirit and you need to make a Holy Ghost New Year's resolution, you get ready to get your feet and, uh, up here and get it done. We'll do a corporate prayer and we'll be done by two minutes to midnight, I promise you. Hebrews 4.14. 4, now listen, Jesus is the great high priest. Is he not? Seeing then that we have the great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our profession. And in verse 15, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly. Here's another one. You got the keys. You don't have to whimper. You don't care what you've done. Prodigal son, you know the story. Come back to him. Whether it's a big one or a little one. Whether you just want to go deeper with God, get it done. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace and help in a time of need.